Here is something you might have said a thousand times. If only they had taught me about money in high school, I would have been a billionaire by now. If that sounds like you, then after this video, you shouldn't have any more excuses. No, seriously, financial education is the key to unlocking your freedom. As they say, knowledge is power. Knowledge about money, however, is the ultimate power. If you have ever been confused by credit or even your taxes, then keep watching to clear up everything. Before you get carried away though, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel for more updates. Banking started when the first currencies were minted and people realized they had to store their money in a safe place. Old systems also needed a financial system that facilitated trade, distributed wealth, and collected taxes. Banks, like today, were responsible for that. The trade by barter system was efficient until it wasn't. It began to prove problematic at the moment when people began traveling from town to town in search of new products to take home. As a result, coins of varying sizes and colors began to be minted in order to create a store of value for trade. Well, coins need to be kept in a safe place, and ancient organizations did not have steel safes. So, the rich people of Rome stored their coins and jewels in the basement of their temples. According to historical records, empires like Babylon, Egypt, Greece, and Rome were said to have loaned money in addition to keeping it safe. It is because of its function as a financial center that temples were usually ransacked during wars. It was easier to hoard and exchange coins than other commodities, such as a 400-pound cow. So, a set of wealthy people began lending coins with interest to people who needed it. Temples usually handled larger loans, you know, those that were required by various sovereigns, while rich merchants handled the rest of the money lending needs. The Romans were known for their expertise in building, so they extracted banking from temples and formalized it within special buildings. During this time, moneylenders profited like loan sharks do today. But even at that time, legitimate commerce and almost all government spending required the use of an institutional bank. According to world history, Julius Caesar was said to have started the practice of allowing moneylenders to seize lands instead of loan payments. This changed the power dynamic between the creditor and debtor, as landowners were usually untouchable. They left their debts unsettled, passing it on to their descendants, until the creditor or the debtor's lineage dies out. The Roman Empire eventually crumbled, but some of its banking systems lived on through the Middle Ages. Small-time moneylenders like papal bankers and the Knights Templar competed with the church and were often condemned for usury. Eventually, the monarchs who reigned in Europe discovered the value of banking institutions. The royal powers began to take loans on the king's terms in order to make up for rough times at the royal treasury. This easy access to spending was exploited by the European monarchs. They led costly wars and weapons races with neighboring kingdoms, not to mention gross extravagances and crushing debt. In 1557, Philip II of Spain succeeded in burdening his kingdom with so much debt as a result of numerous pointless wars. His behavior resulted in the world's first national bankruptcy, as well as the world's second, third, and fourth in rapid succession. This was because a large amount of the country's gross national product went towards servicing the nation's debt. Banking was already properly established in the British Empire when, in 1776, economist Adam Smith came up with his invisible hand theory. Encouraged by his understanding of a self-regulating economy, bankers and moneylenders were provided the option of limiting the state's involvement in the banking sector and the economy as a whole. This free market capitalism gained good ground in the New World, where the United States of America was about to emerge. In its earliest days, the United States had more than one bank currency. Banks could create a currency and distribute it to anyone who would accept it. If a bank fell out, the banknotes it had issued became worthless. This means of banking carried a lot of risk because a single bank robbery could be the end of the bank and its customers. Alexander Hamilton was the first secretary of the U.S. Treasury. He established a national bank that would create a uniform national currency, but the damage had already been done. Americans no longer trusted banks and bankers in general. 
Merchant banks soon took over most of the economic duties, such as loans and corporate finance, that would have been handled by the national banking system. This period lasted into the 1920s. The merchant banks parlayed their international connections into enormous political and financial power. These merchant banks included J.P. Morgan & Company, Goldman Sachs, Kuhn Loeb & Company. As large industries emerged and birthed the need for major corporate financing, the amount of capital needed could not be provided provided by any single bank. As a result, bond offerings and initial public offerings (IPOs) became the only way of raising the amount of money needed. During the late 1800s, J.P. Morgan & Company was founded, right in the middle of the emergence of merchant banks. Connected directly to London, the world's financial center at the time, J.P. Morgan had a substantial clout in the United States. Through a revolutionary use of trust, the bank created duopolies and near monopolies in the railroad and shipping industries. However, it remained strenuous for average Americans to obtain loans or other banking services. Merchant banks did didn't advertise, and rarely extended credit to common people. The financial needs of the everyday citizen were placed in the hands of lesser banks, which were still failing at a scary rate. When the collapse of a copper trust began the bank panic of 1907, the task fell to J.P. Morgan. Morgan used his influence to gather all the major players on Wall Street and persuade them to utilize the credit and capital that they controlled. Ironically, this move ensured that no private banker would ever wield that much power again. In 1913, the U.S. government created the Federal Reserve Bank, also known as the Fed. Merchant banks were pushed into the background by its creation. Despite the establishment of the Fed, a great amount of financial and political power remained concentrated on Wall Street. When World War I broke out, the United States became a global lender, and by the end of the war, it had replaced London as the center of the financial world. World War II might have just been the saving grace of the banking industry from complete destruction. Financial maneuvers involving billions of dollars were required by the war for the banks and the Fed. This massive financing operation birthed companies with large credit needs, which, as a result, encouraged banks into mergers to meet the demand. These huge banks spanned across global markets. Domestic banking in the United States finally settled to the point where there was the availability of deposit insurance, and widespread mortgage lending. The everyday citizen could have confidence in the banking system and reasonable access to credit. The modern era of banking had arrived. The advent of online banking has been the most significant development in the world of banking in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Its earliest forms date back to the 1980s, but really began to take off with the rise of the internet in the mid-1990s. The growing adoption of smartphones and mobile banking apps further accelerated the trend. While many customers still continue to carry out at least some of their businesses at physical banks, a 2021 J.D. Power survey found that 41% of them have gone digital only. A central bank is a financial institution that is authorized by a government to oversee and regulate the nation's monetary system and its commercial banks. It creates and manages the nation's currency. Most of the world's countries have central banks for that purpose. Today, banks are more accessible to the general public. People deposit their money in banks. The bank then lends this unused money out in car loans, mortgages, business loans, and credit cards. The loan recipients invest this money and the bank gains interest on the loans. This process keeps money moving through the system. Commercial banks provide services to the general public and to businesses. They operate ATMs, take deposits, and issue loans. Investment banks provide services only to large companies, institutional investors, and some high net worth individuals. Those services include helping companies raise money by issuing stocks or bonds or obtaining loans. They may also be deal makers, easing corporate mergers and acquisitions. Banks have come a long way from the temples of the ancient world, but their basic business practices have not changed much. Although history has altered the finer points of the business world, a bank's purposes are still to make loans and to protect depositors' money. Even today, where digital banking and financing are replacing traditional brick-and-mortar locations, banks still perform these fundamental functions. It just goes to show that we humans have found a structure that works. Do you agree that the modern economy is a good thing? Let us know your thoughts thoughts in the comments. As always, be sure to like this video and subscribe to this channel. See you next time.